And good evening, everyone. Welcome to Voice of the Province, your voice on the issues that affect you here in New Brunswick. Tonight, our guest is Chris Austin, the leader of the People's Alliance Party of New Brunswick. Chris, welcome back to the show. Great to be here, Jeff. I Great want to you. start out first with the news that came out today that the province of New Brunswick said that the sales from marijuana are not going to turn a profit in the first year. Mm. Are you surprised by this news? No, I'm really not. Um, for the simple reason, I mean, what we've been saying as a party all along is, I mean, obviously marijuana is going to be legalized federally. Um, so, you know, the provincial government really has n no say in, in the legalization of it. What the province, of course, has to do is, is you know, determine how it's going to be sold, how it's going to be regulated, distributed, and all that sort of thing. Um, what we have said is, um, you know, it should be really given to the private sector, uh, regulated, licensed, uh, and flat taxed. Uh, if, if, the, if the province took that approach, uh, you would see revenue coming in and uh, you know we've said the same thing with um, with MB Liquor we'd like to see that streamlined as well you know it's it's my honest opinion that government has enough to worry about you know we've got education health care infrastructure your basic social programs those are the things government should be working for uh, not retailing beer and, and, and marijuana um, you know let the private sector do it enforce the regulations license it make sure it's done right um, but it, it shouldn't be, government shouldn't be in the business of doing business. So then there was a lot of talk leading up to this that, uh, you know, back a bit, that whether government or private business would do this. And in New Brunswick, it's going to be the government running it. But there are a lot of private business owners who are already dabbling in this in New Brunswick, be it legally or illegally, depending on how you look at it. Um, do you think that they were better positioned to be able to satisfy the customer's demands and needs than the government could? Well, it, it would make more sense, um, you know, and again, whether they're doing it legally or illegally, it's quasi-legal battle that they're, they often face, um, they're, they're doing it regardless. And uh, for government to step in and, and monopolize, uh, you know, marijuana sale is just ridiculous. Um, again, we, we got bigger things to worry about. Uh, there's a lot of problems in this, in this province uh, that need, uh, you know, some solutions and, and government needs to grab the reins and, and, and fix things that are going on, getting in the midst of, again, retailing marijuana and alcohol just baffles me. So when the government factored what they projected the sales for marijuana to be, which was $7.2 million this year, they projected it off a date of July 1st. Mm -hmm. But around the time a lot of people were saying that they weren't positive that the federal government would even be able to legalize it by then because of the Senate, be, because of having to roll this out, do you think the government intentionally made that date July 1st to make the numbers look better in their budget or do you think they genuinely thought July 1st was going to be a target they would hit? Um, I think there was a lot of skepticism around when it would actually pass the Senate and, and be approved in, in Canada. Um, so I think that I'm, I'm sure the provincial government <coughs> excuse me, tried to negotiate some of that in their, in their figures to, to bump up those numbers. Um, it wouldn't be the first time that the provincial government has done that. Uh, to try to make the province look better than it is fiscally. Um, so yeah, I, I think it was probably on purpose. Well, on the note of the government running the sales of marijuana, the, the government of New Brunswick has been touting their locations for the last couple of weeks, and it looks like we're very well poised to be ahead of a lot of provinces when it comes to this rollout. Do you think that's a, a good thing for New Brunswick? Do you think that portrays us as a province that's ready for this kind of rollout? Well, there's a lot of questions that are asked uh, around it. Um, one thing is impaired driving. It always seems <laughs> to keep coming up from a public safety point of view. Um, so I think, you know, and maybe this is more of a federal government uh, should have done more in terms of equipping uh, police force, forces around the country on how to, uh, you know, spot it and, and identify it and, and then to, you know, proceed with some uh, evidence towards it. Um, but again, I, I, I think that the provincial government is really taking the wrong approach on this. Uh, I just, I, I don't understand why, you know, again, we, we have to uh, allow the government to monopolize this, this industry or, or any industry in, in retail in that sense. Um, you know, it's, it's better in the hands of, of the private sector, again, with strong regulations, licensing and, and strict enforcement, and then flat tax it and, and take the revenue. Okay. I want to move on now to the issues of paramedics in New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, this came back to light with a tragic event in the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. And QP is calling on the province to improve recruitment and retention. Just how bad is the situation out there right now? 
when they say there's a paramedic crisis in New Brunswick, um, they're not overstating it. It, it. It's a reality. I talk to paramedics on a regular basis. They're demoralized. They're frustrated. Um, they're, they're at their wits end. You have paramedics that have been working for years and still cannot get permanent full-time work. And at the very center of it uh, is language. It's the fact that the, the provincial government has put this high threshold of bilingual requirement, two plus, for permanent full-time positions. And you know, when you talk about uh, paramedic, uh, um, you know, retaining paramedics or keeping them in the system, the issue doesn't go with recruitment. We don't need more paramedics. We need the paramedics we currently have getting full-time permanent jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no shortage of paramedics in New Brunswick. That's, that's a myth. Uh, what they're saying is there's a shortage of bilingual paramedics in New Brunswick. So what we are saying is let's lower the threshold of bilingual requirement, uh, base it on your demographic. There's obviously areas of the province you're, you're going to need a bilingual paramedic, that's reasonable. But in many areas of the province we have a dedicated translation line which is in every single ambulance. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got cities like Toronto that deal with multiple language on an annual basis. They seem to do fine. You've got other jurisdictions around the world that do the same thing. Here in New Brunswick, we can't seem to grapple two languages. Mm. We've been trying for, for decades. So again, a little common sense can be applied here. Matter of fact, the arbitrator in the ruling uh, with, uh, with the union in Ambulance New Brunswick actually said just that. They, you know, they, they, he said what we have been saying all along, use some common sense, use your translation lines, and uh, you know, hire some of these part-time paramedics and full-time permanent positions. All right, well, we're going to go right to the phones, right out of the gate. We've got Bo from Nakawick on the line. Bo, go ahead. Hi there, guys. How are you? Hi, Bo. Pretty good. What's your question tonight, Bo? Well, I, I, I don't really have a question. I just wanted, you know, I seen that Mr. Austin was on there. And, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I guess I'm a huge fan of Chris Austin. Now, he's won me over um, simply just because the, I'm, I used to support other parties, but uh, I decided, you know, I'm sick and tired of both liberals and PCs in New Brunswick, so I decided to go and and do something brand new altogether. So I, People's Alliance, to me, is the only party in New Brunswick that offers real change now. The liberals and the progressive conservatives are one and the very same. I'm so sick and tired of them two parties. Um, you know, they, the Liberals and the PCs, they have run this province into the ground. They, they've almost bankrupt us. Uh, they put us on the wrong road, and they play the same game over and over. They tell you what you want to hear during an election campaign, and then after the election's over, you don't hear from them two parties again until the next election. And I'm just sick and tired of the way the Liberals and the Progressive Conservatives in New Brunswick have have uh, almost destroyed this province, and I, I, I believe this is a great province, a good province to live, raise a family in, um, but I think we need real leadership, and uh, only leadership that the People's Alliance will bring. Um, Chris Austin is an excellent guy, and I think he's the best leader of all the political leaders in New Brunswick. Basically, in, in provincial politics, I support the People's Alliance, I support Chris Austin, 110%. I believe in the PAMB policies, 110%. And I have to go and, and truly, at election time, I, I get people asking me, why are you going to split the vote? You want the Liberals to win? And I tell them, you know what? It doesn't make a difference if the Liberals win or the PC party win. What difference does it make? They're one and the same. So I, I'm... I'm hoping for some PAMB representatives in the legislature after the election, and we're going to have a real different vo kind of voice in the New Brunswick legislature for a change. Um, and the Liberals and the PCs, they are running scared right now, and they have a right to be because they put themselves in the position where other parties like the PAMB or the Green Party or, you know, parties that have been on the outside for so many years, they, they're actually in a position where they're going to elect MLAs this time. And the Liberals and the Conservatives in New Brunswick are running scared because they're, because they sh they, they should be. Yep. And uh, that's all I got to say. And I want to say to Chris, you're doing a great job, buddy. You know, keep it up. I'm behind you 100%. We're going to elect some PA and Bs after this election. Trust me. I feel it. I hear it. And uh, it's, I can't wait until the election to have a different New Brunswick legislature. Good stuff, Bo. No, I, I appreciate that. And you know, what I hear like tonight from Bo is what we're hearing a lot on the streets as well. You, you have a lot of people 
that you know have had previous party affiliation they've either been strong liberal strong conservative but they've come to the realization that as Bo said there's there's no difference between these two parties anymore I mean uh, they govern the same way they'll both raise your taxes they'll both cut your services um, it's just the same type of engine that continues to run red or blue and you know I mean it's common knowledge that in New Brunswick we we tend to vote parties out but we have to take a different approach at some point we have to say you know let's vote a party in that that has a fresh vision a, a different way of thinking because we can't keep doing what we've always done and expect New Brunswick to turn around we, we've got to look at things differently from a different fresh set of eyes and that's certainly what we bring to the table so we'll, we'll come back to paramedics here in a bit but let's mm -hmm. let's stay on this topic for a little bit why do you think New Brunswickers are entrenched in their 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 habits of voting liberal conservative for the last 20 years I always, when I do my town halls, I always relate it to my, my grandfather. <clears throat> my grandfather was a, a, a real die-hard uh, Toronto Maple Leafs fan. And I remember on Saturday nights, you know, with Don Cherry and, and uh, McLean, you know, it was a big event, Saturday night, hockey night in Canada, and Grampy would be there and the Toronto Maple Leafs would be playing. And let's face it, sometimes they played really bad, <laughs> right? But Grampy was such a strong Maple Leafs fan that it didn't matter. I mean, he would get mad and he would, you know, bounce and complain about, uh, about how bad the Maple Leafs were playing. But I guarantee you the following Saturday, Grampy was on the same spot on the same couch watching the same team. Mm -hmm. And I always thought to myself, you know, for hockey and, and sports, I mean, that's, that's I, I kind of admire that. That's kind of neat. But when you take it to a political level, frankly, it's, it's, it is that very type of loyalty that is hurting the province. Mm -hmm. Because what it does is when you have party loyalty to that extent, where you vote liberal, you vote conservative, regardless, um, you, you, you weaken the party in and of itself, where they no longer have to uh, provide anything new, anything fresh. They just simply wait their turn. And that's what is fundamentally hurting this province in the end. So we, we have to break that. And I, I'm so glad because I'm seeing it, I'm hearing it, where we have a lot of seniors even that are saying, look, I voted liberal my whole life. I voted conservative my whole life. I'm done. And, uh, and, and the proof is in the pudding. Look around at your province. I tell people, if you look around at this province and you're happy with the way things are, vote red or blue. Take your pick because they're both the same. But if you're not happy, as most New Brunswickers are not, you have to vote different. It's just that simple. So I'm going to ask you the question, and Bo kind of touched on this a bit. Is there a sense of New Bruns in New Brunswick that if you don't vote for red or you don't vote for blue, your vote is a waste and you've lost the election? Yeah, and, and that's, that is what the two parties are, uh, continue to put out there. Um, that's the talking points. You see, when, when, you, when you can't or when you fail to come out with any real uh, policies, ideas, fresh thinking, then you revert to fear-mongering. And it's this idea of a split vote. You know, I, just, just from a, a purely, um, f again, fundamental point of view, a vote is yours. Nobody owns your vote. They're not entitled to your vote. Uh, and, and when they say things like that, I think as voters, we should be, uh, frankly, uh, offended by that. You know, nobody owns my vote. It's mine. And to say we're splitting a vote is, is just ridiculous. But if that's the way they want to go, if, if, you know, the Conservatives want to say we're splitting the vote, fine. The Liberals are telling us we're going to split the vote on that side too. So I'm fine with splitting, splitting the votes of both. We'll take some Liberals, we'll take some Conservatives, and we'll win. Fine with me. Now, with David Kuhn, the leader of the Green Party, winning in the last election, does that open the floodgates or at least change the perception of people that, yes, a third party can be elected in the province. Uh, absolutely, and, and I, I give uh, David Kuhn credit. Uh, you know, David worked hard last election, as we all did, um, you know, and he was able to pull it off and get his foot in the door, and I, I commend him for that. And I think uh, that, that, you know, that very well has opened the eyes to say, look, uh, there's no such thing as a wasted vote, and there's no such thing as a split vote. You vote for what you believe in, you vote for, for change and, and for a different New Brunswick, and, uh, and, and you do, you know, your civic duty at the ballot box. And uh, I, I believe, I'm, I'm convinced, New Brunswick will be a better place if, if we do that. Now, in the last election, in 2014 provincial election, the People's Alliance, the Green Party, and the NDP combined for 20% of the popular vote in the province, give or take. Mm -hmm. it, but it's only represented by one out of 49 seats in the province. Mm -hmm. So one-fifth of New Brunswick voted for either Green Party, People's Alliance, or NDP. Mm -hmm. But only one seat represented. Is it time to consider proportional representation or a system like that in New Brunswick to better represent the intents of the voters in the province? There's no question that our current first-past-the-post system has a lot of flaws. 
um, you know, just with the statistics you just gave, the data you just gave, as well as you look at previous governments. There have been previous governments that have formed majority governments but not, have not gotten the majority of the vote mm -hmm. in, in terms of the overall population of registered voters. So it's obviously a flawed system. Uh, we've looked at different types or versions of proportional representation. Our only concern is, uh, you know, if, if you do change it, is to simplify it to the point where average Joe that goes to vote uh, isn't confused by what they're voting for. So, um, you know, but, but again, I, I do agree. We need something different uh, to be able to get, uh, you know, more voices in there and, and more representation is what it boils down to. Because like you said, um, you know, you've got a high threshold of people that did vote alternate red or blue, but yet only one voice in there to, to speak for them. Now, some people argue that if you do proportional representation, that it's going to open it up for fringe or dangerous parties to get control or get a say in government. Is this something you agree with, or is, do you think it's more fear-mongering? Uh, it's more fear-mongering. Look, <clears throat> we've had this two-party system since, since you know, New Brunswick's been around. And uh, obviously, uh, you know, when, whenever, whenever that system feels threatened, um, you know, they're going to do what they can to, to try to keep their, their, their time in power. But uh, look, and, and what's going on in New Brunswick today, there, there is a wind that's blowing here. And it's the winds of change in terms of how people look at politics and government. And I, I'm, I'm, I, I'd like to say it's just here in New Brunswick, but when you look on a global scale, it's, it's all around the world, where people are just simply tired of this elitist status quo type of politics and government, where people don't have a voice anymore in their government, uh, governments are making decisions that are off, oftentimes in, in contrast to the, the, the majority uh, of the way they think. And as a result, what we have is we have you know, systems that are no longer working for the people that tend to work against them. So I'm, I'm very optimistic that the time has come where, where people are just saying, you know what, enough is enough. And, uh, and they're looking for change and, and they're, they're looking for an alternative. We've got just a few seconds before the first break, but just a quick yes or no question. Is this something that should be put to a referendum in New Brunswick to let the people decide? In terms of? Uh, uh, proportional representation or changing the electoral system? I'd certainly be open to that. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we're going to take a quick break. We're going to be back with more with Chris Austin, and we're going to talk a bit more about paramedics as well as the Auditor General's report. So you're watching Voice of the Province. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to Voice of the Province. I'm Jeff Dapery filling in for Troy Glover, who's away this week. Our guest tonight is Chris Austin, the leader of the People's Alliance Party of New Brunswick. And if you've got a question, you can give us a call at 1-866-414-3628. That number will be on your screen as we uh, continue through the segment. So Chris, I'm going to jump back now. Actually, you know what? Let's go to the phone lines first. I believe we have Stephen from Fredericton on the line. Stephen, are you there? Yes, I am here. Fire away with your question, Stephen. Thanks for calling. So, uh, thanks for be doing this, uh, Chris. It's uh, greatly appreciated that uh, we get a chance to, uh, you know, uh, uh, get this close where you're abroad on the TV more than anything else. I just uh, was online and uh, seen that you were going to be on. And one of my questions was, uh, I understand, and, and this is a, just a bit of a personal experience, is that um, if you could touch a little bit on mental health here in uh, in Region 3 um, with uh, there's lots of people files being closed uh, with mental illness and uh, you know um, what I uh, what I experienced myself was uh, my case had been brought over to uh, my doctor and uh, what I experienced there was my doctor didn't have that kind of time to uh, take care of that issue. Um, I just suffer from bipolar disorder, but, uh, you know, uh, adjustments of medication, stuff like that. But, uh, you know, uh, the strain on doctors right now here in the province is just phenomenal. And with the nursing, too, everybody leaving here to go to the States or to go out west and towards Ontario, um, you know, uh, would you have an opinion on... Um, <laughs> uh, 
what you could do in terms of uh, bringing, you know, that work back here to the province. You know, the wait times we know are just phenomenal, especially just here in Fredericton uh, at the hospital. And if you want to go to a clinic, uh, you're going to the clinic two hours, three hours before it opens. So, you know, or the morning clinic, which is the same wait times and stuff like that. And I know it's, it's like that all over the place, um, but I'm just speaking here from Fredericton in my own experience. Um, to bring the jobs back here, you know, um, maybe even, you know, because I, I, I am a home support worker, special care attendant myself, and, uh, you know, there's it's a lot of work. You know, I worked five years into that trade, and it's a lot of work for minimum wage for anybody. Uh, and the diversity of people in that trade is from 20 years old right up to 50 years old and more, taking care of elderly people and, and you know, the baby boomer age being at that age now where there's many, like 13 million baby boomers here just in Canada, where that workload is going to be tremendously more a lot faster than what we think it's going to be. Even though we are living a little bit longer, the spending age, the baby boomer age, has really put an impact, you know, um, on buying and, and eating not healthy and, and, and that kind of w workload too. Yes. Um, all good points, Stephen, and, and uh, you know, valid questions. I guess mental health, we'll, we'll kind of go there first. You would mentioned that. Um, you know, the Auditor General came out with a report, and in the report was mental health of, of inmates that are incarcerated and how uh, shocking it was that uh, many of these inmates go into, go into provincial jails and a lot of them, if they were on, you know, medication before for their mental health, when they get into to prison, a lot of times that medication isn't even carried over. So they're, they're cut off by being incarcerated. There's no support for them in, in the jails. And I thought to myself when I read this report about the provincial jails and mental health for inmates, I thought that really is a picture of the whole province in general. Mm -hmm. Because whether you're an inmate in a provincial jail or your average Joe on the street, if you have mental health problems, it's very difficult to get help. It's, it's very difficult to, to be diagnosed and, and to get the proper treatment that you need. Um, and it, it, mental health is a huge issue. Yeah. There, there's no question. Oh, it's yeah. really becoming a big issue. Um, and I think, you know, what, what is obviously needed is more resources have to be poured into it. Um, and again, this gets back to what we're saying. If, if government can get to a place where they stop spending money on needless things, I mean, I mean, look, just to give you an example, I mean, the, the current government's been going around campaigning and they're throwing money around like, like candy on a parade. <laughs> uh, $50 million they've announced here a while back for a museum in St. John. They're dumping 140 some million into a four-lane highway in Shediac. All these things we just simply don't need. What we need is we need more resources for mental health, more, more professionals to be able to help. We need, uh, uh, you know, jail systems to be able to, to help the inmates that are there uh, with, with their issues. So mental health is a big issue, Stephen, I, I, I agree, and I think at the end of the day it, it's a matter of resources that, that needs to be dumped into it. So on the question then of health care in New Brunswick and mental health care as well, are public-private partnerships the solution? I don't know. If I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sold on that. Um, and, and I'll tell you, just on a, on a different scale, if you look at MetaV, um, hmm. you know, you look at Ambulance New Brunswick, people say to me, well, now you've got the extramural program, which MetaV is going to be managing and, and they say, well, how do you think that's going to go? They ask me and I say, well, the best way to know how that's going to go is to look at how they're managing Ambulance New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. And, <coughs> excuse me, we see all the issues around Ambulance New Brunswick with, with paramedics, with uh, ambulances out of service, with the secrecy. I mean, that you know, you take Ambulance New Brunswick to committees, uh, MLAs have, and they can't get straight answers out of them. Media has to take them to court, literally, <laughs> to get information out of them. So this, this, this private uh, side of, of, of trying to, to do government services, I'm skeptical. Again, education, health care, and your infrastructure should be brought under the public domain, and it should be kept under the public, public domain, and to be done efficiently and effectively. And if there's areas where it's not being done efficiently and effectively, that's where you change it. By kicking it out to, to the private sector, um, it doesn't always pan out so good. So 
what is going to be the breaking point where government says, yes, we absolutely need to increase our spending and solve the mental health issues mm -hmm. that the province has? What, what's it going to take for the government to pump all of that, as you said, chucking money like a, a parade is in town? What's it going to take? I, I think it's going to take average Joe to realize um, that, uh, and again, the two parties simply want what is politically best to keep them elected. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, what has worked, what has set precedent, is what Gallant's doing. I mean, th this is politics as normal. You go out before an election, three months, six months before, you promise the world, you, you, you just money here, money there, announcements, re-announce, and, and you're buying votes with the people's own money. So fundamentally, it comes back to the people. And we have to simply say, we're not buying this game anymore, and, and, and we're not going to play it. We want to see policy ideas. We want to see a different vision, a different direction on how we're going to be governed. Quit trying to buy my vote and, and think something, something outside the box to be able to get our fiscal state in order and to get the province back to a place where it can, it can you know, sustain itself. I think uh, another thing Stephen mentioned too that I, I do want to bring up, talked about being a home care worker mm -hmm. and the senior growing, growing yeah. senior demographic. I think the federal government has to help here too. I, I, I mean, of course, as a province, we have to get ourselves in order to be able to handle the, the increasing um, age of mm -hmm. our population. But the federal government's got to recognize that. New Brunswick is truly unique in the sense that we have the highest aging population in the country. And that's not going away. Yeah. And, and when you look at the fiscal situation, when you look at the unemployment rate, when you look at all the challenges we're facing now, unfortunately, unless we have a real serious shift, that's going to get worse because on top of all that, we have an aging population. We have our skilled workforce. They're going to Alberta and Saskatchewan to work. Those that are left behind, uh, unfortunately, you know, they, they want to enjoy their retirement years in, in New Brunswick, uh, but the system is, is struggling to be able to support them. Do you think in situations like that, the government is often more reactionary than preventative? Definitely. Uh, is there a way that we can change that? Uh, is it a matter of changing governments or is it a matter of telling government, look, a lot of these problems wouldn't be an issue. Mm -hmm. Surprise, out of the blue, they're an issue. Uh, they wouldn't be that kind of thing if the government was taking steps to look at the numbers and say, yeah, we're getting older and right. healthcare is gonna be a major issue. Um, so let's invest in that early to try to curtail that before it becomes a problem. Is it just a matter of convincing government of that, or do you think you have to change the government in order to do well, that? Well, I, th I think you have to change the way you're thinking mm -hmm. as a government. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what stripe is in there. If, if the thinking is the same or, or relatively the same as it's always been, don't expect any changes. I mean, that's just common sense. So, you know, whoever is in government, they have to change the way that they're looking at the problem and to find solutions that are outside the box. I mean, we've done this, 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 and this. It hasn't worked. So why do we keep doing the very same things we've done before and expect some type of different outcome? We have to change the way we're doing things to, to find solutions to these problems. Um, someone mentioned to me, you know, healthcare is, is the, obviously the largest part of the provincial budget and they, they liken it to a big black hole. And they said you can put as much money you, as you want into it, but that big black hole is gonna swallow up uh, any extra resources. So it's not just about putting money into it. That's one equation, of course, but it's really about management too and delivery of services. Um, how do we get our healthcare system in a place where, you know, not just for, um, you, know, uh, you know, seniors populations, but for healthcare in general, how do we make New Brunswick healthier? How do we make people healthier so that they spend less time in acute care and uh, can live healthier lives. All right, let's go back to the phones. We've got Edward on the line from St. John. Edward, how are you tonight? Fine, thank you. How are you? Oh, not bad. Uh, what's your question for Chris? I have a comment. I just uh, appreciate what uh, Chris is doing. And uh, he's very smart, and I'm going to be voting for him in this election. Uh, a couple of things. He was speaking about the ambulance. There's a young lady here in Chris Bam says, she graduated, she graduated from the University of uh, Newfoundland with very high marks. They wouldn't hire her in St. John because she wasn't bilingual. The city of St. John wouldn't hire her because she wasn't bilingual. So she went back to Newfoundland uh, this year, and the uh, company in Alberta seen her qualifications, and they hired her immediately just as soon as she got back to Newfoundland. Yep. So there's definitely something wrong with this there, with this bilingual. It's, there's nothing wrong with bilingualism. It's just how it's being... Uh, put into place mm. and uh, uh, you're, you're probably you're probably one of the smartest politicians on the route right now so keep up the good work 
and I'll be looking forward to voting for you in the fall. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. I really appreciate that. Um, and, and Edward's right. And what he said, you know, he supports bilingualism, mm -hmm. but he doesn't support the way it's, it's, it's being run. That's exactly what we're saying. You know, people sometimes get the impression that when we talk about language that somehow we're, we're, we're against a certain, you know, we're against the French or whatnot. That is so far from the truth. Mm -hmm. What we want to see is a province that works for everybody. Um, and, 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 you know, receiving service in your language of choice is a constitutional right in New Brunswick. We support that. We believe in that. What we don't believe in is the way it's being implemented. Why do you need a paramedic in St. John to be bilingual, right? In, 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 in a city like St. John in a region that is predominantly, predominantly Anglophone, mm -hmm. especially when every single ambulance has that dedicated translation line. And they've used it in the past for other languages, other, other uh, dialects uh, of patients, mm -hmm. and it's worked perfectly, flawlessly. But yet, you know, when it, when it comes into uh, the French-English thing, it, it just goes all to pieces. It baffles me that, you know, there's European countries, there's, there's cities, mega cities around the world that deal with multiple cultures, multiple languages, and they, they do it, they do it well. New Brunswick, we just do everything wrong, and, 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 and then we keep repeating what we've been doing wrong, hoping it'll get better. <laughs> I'll give you just an example. You got the ambulance crisis going on in New Brunswick due to, due to language and, and uh, not permanent full-time work for, for paramedics. So you've got that going on. The Liberal Party, they want to go to the court over it, so they want to throw it at the court system. You've got the opposition, and they want to basically say that paramedics should learn French. Well, put that in, and that sounds great in theory. I mean, that, that, we've been hearing that for years, just learn French. Great in theory. But in practical terms, you take a paramedic that's working, you know, he doesn't have the full-time permanent, but they are getting, say, 40, 45 hours a week, mm -hmm. and then tell them on the evenings they've got to take an online course to learn French, <clears throat> and then to get to a two-plus French, it's not going to happen. It's not realistic. It's not feasible. And we have to stop, you know, sugarcoating this and dancing around the issue of, oh, just learn French. That's not the issue. The issue is the unnecessary language requirements in the first place. If you put them down to a level where they're reasonable and base it on your demographic, your problem's solved. So, uh, just before we go back to the phone lines, uh, on that note then, uh, Blaine Higgs had mentioned that he favors a, uh, a higher first train later approach. Is that something you're not for? It's just nonsense. It's not that I'm not for it. In, in, in a utopia of a world, yes, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. But in reality, that will not happen. You, you cannot take somebody working full time, possibly having kids or whatever, they're living their lives, and expect them to learn uh, a two plus uh, French requirement, which I, I, I know, I've talked to Acadians that have failed the test that's been put out by the province. So you're expecting unilingual Anglophones all of a sudden to take an online Rosetta Stone course or whatever you know, the government's offering and expect them to get to two plus, it's nonsense. Brian Gallant, the Premier, did the same thing. He came out and said, look, you know, uh, we're, we're going to offer, you know, courses for unemployed so that uh, unilingual Anglophones can learn French. Uh, and then he appointed a Celtic minister like it was going to appease everybody. It's all of this nonsense that we do on the outside rather than dealing with the heart of the issue. And the heart of the issue is making sure that French and English citizens are, are receiving service, but also making sure it's done in a common sense way based on your demographic and where the numbers warrant. All right, let's go back to the phones. We've got Walter on the line from Moncton. Walter, how are you tonight? Not too bad. How are you? Not too bad. Uh, fire away with your question. Okay, I got two questions. Okay. First thing I want to know, if you become to be premier, are you going to let Mr. Irving Company run this province like the Liberals and the Conservatives have been doing for the last 40 years? And when you come to be premier, if you do, how many times are you going to come on this TV station and let us talk to you? Because the premiers can sit on here, they don't even want to talk to us when they're on a premier come to the show. So I would like for you to answer them two questions for me. Good, good questions. I'd like to answer question or <laughs> echo question two too, Chris. <laughs> yeah, good uh, questions. So uh, yeah, um, so the first question was in regards to the Irvings. Yeah, look, um, you know, we we believe that New Brunswick needs uh, needs the econ economic development that 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 can you know let the private sector do it and grow. Um, you know, the Irving obviously plays a part in that. Um, look, we are not anti-Irving, we're not anti-industry. What we do want, on the other hand, is to make sure that any industry that comes into the province, that when it comes to the resources, that New Brunswickers get the benefit of that. 
Um, you know, that's why we had serious problems with the Allward Forestry Agreement, because we felt like the agreement itself increased the allotment of, of uh, or allocation of wood, but yet the private woodlot owners are still getting the same rates or sometimes lower rates than they were getting 30 years ago. So here you've got 40,000 plus private woodlot owners whose wood's just sitting there, and we have industry cutting on crown land when they should be cutting on private woodlot owners as primary source, and then using the crown lead if, if they need more within a reasonable level. I'm gonna jump in right here, Chris. We've gotta take a quick break. We'll be right back after this and we'll continue this, uh, this conversation on Voice of the Province. Thank you for joining us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Voice of the Province here on Rogers TV. If you've got a question tonight for Chris Austin, the leader of the People's Alliance Party, you can give us a call at 1-866-414-3628. Now, Chris, before I rudely interrupted you going to break, uh, we had a question from, uh, I believe it was Walter in Moncton, who wanted to know, if you're Premier, what kind of uh, role will the Irvings play in your government? Mm -hmm. Well, and again, uh, the, the Irvings, uh, you know, again, they, they, they are uh, a, f a fundamental part of New Brunswick. but. I would treat them as I would any other industry. I don't think there should be these un unlevel playing fields. Um, I'll give you an example, like, like we oppose the spraying of uh, glyphosate on Crown land for several reasons. Uh, we, we, we question uh, the effects on environment, habitat and human health. And secondly, we see it from a jobs perspective where, you know, when you spray, um, you take away jobs of civil culture where you know before they went in manually with either machines or thinning saws and and they they clear cut um, or they you know manage the forest mm -hmm. as opposed to the plane going over and spraying the chemical down to do it so um, again we've opposed that uh, and we've called for for an end to to the spraying so we're, we're you know again there's got to be that fine balance and on Walter's second question, very quickly before we go back to the phones, he was talking about if you're premier, are you going to hide and duck away from the media? And now we're in an age now where social media is a lot more prevalent and governments can get their messages out through their own Facebook, through their own Twitter and control the message that way. Um, first of all, do you think it's important that the premier or government continue to maintain a uh, you know, getting the message out through media and actually take questions in the case of this show from viewers? Mm -hmm. uh, or do you think the times are changing and that perhaps, you know, viewers should migrate to Facebook, to Twitter and uh, communicate in that fashion? I, I think it should be, uh, you know, both sides of the coin, right? Uh, obviously, social media is playing a big part. We use it as a political party, as a leader. I, you know, I'm constantly on uh, either Twitter or Facebook, you know, between meetings or events and, you know, the schedule that I have in the run of a day to try to get on and connect with people in, in social media. Uh, but on the flip side, you, you, you don't want to rule out what we're doing here mm -hmm. because there's a segment, obviously, of the population that, that needs this for information purposes. Really, at the end of the day, it's about accountability. It's about information. And I feel, you know, that, that both when you're in the campaign mode and after you're elected, you have to be accountable to the people and you've got to be willing to talk about the issues that are important to them. So, look, I, I don't know what to say to that question directly other than, um, you know, I'll, I'll be the same Chris after elected as I am before. I, you know, I, I believe we have to change the system of government and politics and I intend to keep doing it inside and outside the legislature. So if you're a Premier, you'll come on the show on September 27th. Oh, that sounds good. Right. <laughs> we'll make it a date. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go back to the phone lines now. We have Clarence on the line. Clarence, how are you tonight? Good. Uh, what's your question for Chris? Uh, Chris, in the line of the civil service, how do you propose to change the civil service so that it listens to the leader, not does what the leader doesn't want them to do? Mm -hmm. There's been a shift in politics, I think, in government over the years, where I think elected officials and governments that are elected have lost control, I think, maybe in a certain sense of, of you know, the direction they want to take the province. And I think it's important that, you know, government realizes that they are the ultimate authority in how, you know, the, the direction of the province and how it goes. And I think it's important to work with the civil service on that. I mean, you know, you, you obviously have uh, people that are on the front lines that know how the job is done. Mm -hmm. And it's not up to politicians to sit in a bubble in Fredericton to determine things that they know nothing about without, you know, uh, you know 
talking to the people at work it every day. So again, it, it, it's really about looking at the bigger picture, making sure that those you know that are in the civil services are, are uh, doing what they should be doing, that government administers effective delivery, efficient delivery, and uh, and and making it making government work for the people again, as opposed to what oftentimes happens is you get you know these these political appointments within the bureaucracy, mm -hmm. high paying positions. And a lot of times when you look at them, you, you kind of scratch your head and wonder, are they necessary? And why are the taxpayers paying, you know, six-figure salaries for some of these positions? So, yeah, I mean, you know, those things have to be looked at. What, what we focus on, what, what we are determined to do, is to make sure that front line is not only maintained but enhanced. So if that means, you know, you meet, may need more on the front line and less in the administrative side, then that's exactly what we would do to find efficiencies there so that the delivery of service is, uh, is the, the main target. Um, is the machine, if you want to call it that, is the machine now so gummed up that it's going to be impossible to change it over a short term? Is this a, a long-term attempt to change how government works yeah. or are we just perpetually stuck with, well, no, this is how we've always done it, this is how it will be? I love the way the Auditor General put it. She said, New Brunswick is like the Titanic heading for the iceberg, and you're not going to change the course of the Titanic in one fell swoop, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's a gradual process, um, and I, I agree with that. I, I, I'm not so naive to say is, you know, we have a silver bullet that everything's going to be perfect in New Brunswick. But what I am saying is we have to chart a different course. We have to do things we've never done before and think differently. I don't mean that in a negative way. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's positive things we can do that we've never done before that just, you know, our current uh, system of government just simply refuses to do. And again, because the way our electoral system has worked, this system is working for them. So it's when the people rise up and say, it may be working for the politicians, but this system's not working for the people. And when they start voting differently, then you get different ideas in there, you get fresh thinking, you get outside the box thinking, and you can kind of rationalize what needs to be done to, you know, again, to turn that ship away from the iceberg. All right. We're going to go back to the phones. We have Andrea from Moncton calling in. How are you tonight? Fine, thank you. And yourself? I'm not doing too bad. Uh, what's your question for Chris? Yes. Uh, hi, Chris. How are you tonight? Hi, Andrea. Good. Thanks for calling. Thank you. Um, if I was an employer of a company and I was to hire 10 people, I would hire five people that are bilingual and then I would hire another five people that just speaks English. Uh, do you feel that's a good idea? Um, I understand where you're coming from. My, 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 my argument is simply this. It, there shouldn't be a one-size-fits-all across the province, and I think that's the fundamental problem. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you've got the language commissioner's office, which is constantly pushing this envelope to the edge all the time. More bilingual staff. She just put out her last report before she retires. Mm -hmm. They got to do better on bilingualism. They got to get more bilingual people out there. A one-size-fits-all hasn't worked for New Brunswick. It's not working. It's not going to work. What we need to do is we need to look at the province and we need to look at our demographics and say where is the need uh, you know, for bilingual service mm -hmm. and make sure that needs met. When you talk about centralized services, make sure the need is met. But when you're talking about frontline service like Service New Brunswick's or, I mean, it gets so ridiculous that I, <coughs> excuse me, I see job postings for DTI, um, you know, uh, maintenance mm -hmm. needing to be bilingual. Well, why, why, why would, why would a, a maintenance position, a DTI, need to be bilingual? But I hear these things often in, in the public sector. So, you know, I wouldn't say you need five if you've got ten. I would say where is the need? and meet that need. If that means you only need two bilingual people to meet the need, hire two bi bilingual people. If it means you need six, hire six. Wherever the need is, meet the need, but get away from this one size fits all. Okay. We're going to go back to the phone lines again. We have Leo from my old stomping ground of Minto. Leo, how are you doing tonight? Hey, how are you doing tonight, Derek? Not bad. What's your question for Chris? Uh, uh, my question is that ripoff of a motor vehicle question, uh, inspection. Mm -hmm. I am so tired of hearing people don't want to go or do these jobs, but they can't get to the jobs. That is something's got to be done about that. Do you, do you mean the M MVI vehicle inspections? Yes. yes. Yeah. 
So what, what we proposed last election, and uh, we've talked about it as well going forward, is uh, you know if you if you buy a new vehicle, mm. I, I agree. I mean it is kind of silly to to have to have your vehicle inspected it just come off the assembly mm -hmm. line, right? So what we've said is for the first uh, uh, I think it was three years of that vehicle, you would not need a motor vehicle inspection, and then that was up to a hundred thousand kilometers. So after three years, then you'd be required to to get an inspection every two years after that. So you know there's some validity to it. I, you know, I, I'm kind of torn on the issue. Uh, other provinces have no motor vehicle inspections. Seems to be o working okay for those provinces. Um, but I think what we do have is, is overkill. Uh, and again, I use again the example of a new car. I mean, I, I bought a new van here a few years ago, and uh, you know, had to take it in and, and get it inspected. And you know, kind of scratch your head, why, why, why am I doing this? You know, it's a good. That's a very good question. On that, in that note, then is it. Are there a lot of issues with government where there are fees for things that don't necessarily make sense? Is it a quick cash grab by government? 100%. Okay, I was gonna say, is it an established yeah. procedure, but? Yep, and I'll give you another example talking about uh, the Motor Vehicle Act. Uh, look at vehicle registrations. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we, we go by law and we have to register our vehicle every year, but have you ever asked yourself the question, why am I registering my vehicle <laughs> every year? Has the government forgot that I own the vehicle? Well, of course they didn't forget. When you register, when you purchase a vehicle, it's registered in the database. You pay to register the vehicle, and it stays in the database for as long as you own it until you sell it, and then you know the new person would register it. So this idea of renew, renewing vehicles every year, it is. It's a money grab, and unfortunately, as a, as a, as a population, we've gotten to a place where we just kind of come to accept it, and we need to start questioning these things. What is the purpose to a motor vehicle, annual motor vehicle registration? Mm -hmm. And is it a tax grab? In our opinion, it is nothing more than a tax grab, and that's why we're determined you know, to, to phase that out and to end uh, motor vehicle registrations on an annual basis and do it upon purchase. Now, I'm going to jump back to something we were talking about in the first segment, uh, about paramedics in New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. And you've been on the show a few times now, and each time we've talked a little bit about this. It's clearly not a problem that is either going away, nor has it only been around for a short period of time. So why has the government not been able to fix it up to this point? I think, uh, I think it's political will. Mm -hmm. I, I think it, the, the government has to just stand up and say, this is the way it's going to be. It was the same thing with dual busing, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, God forbid we put French and English children on the same bus here in New Brunswick, right? So they tried that in a certain uh, region of the province when the Minister of Education found out, immediately put a stop to it. Said, no, we're not gonna have French and English children travel on the same bus, separate them. So there's millions of dollars we're spending on that, not to mention what we're doing to the social fabric of our, of our province by again, using that segregated idea of separating people simply based on language. Um, so the government, rather than doing the right thing and simply saying, no, that's, that, we're, we're going to put the kids on the same bus, mm -hmm. you know, reasonably, <laughs> um, instead they kicked it to the court, right? We're seeing the same thing with the paramedic issue. Rather than saying, no, hold it, this doesn't make sense, here's what is a reasonable, rational thing to do, as the arbitrator said, I agree with him 100%, follow through on that, instead they take it to court. So government's got to start governing, mm -hmm. and they got to start making decisions and going with it and uh, doing it for the best interest of the people. So the government of New Brunswick, and it, I believe it has been ramping up the training for paramedics in the province and trying to get more paramedics into the system. What happens if there's just simply not enough paramedics that meet the criteria? Mm -hmm. Here's the issue with the training of paramedics. This is what a lot of people aren't aware of. Um, there is a rec recruitment effort going on for paramedics. However, that recruitment effort is only available in francophone community colleges. If I wanted to become a paramedic, you know, down the road, mm -hmm. and I wanted to go take training, I have no options in terms of uh, public colleges to take the course. So I have to go to a private college to take the same paramedic course mm. that is offered in a francophone college where it can be paid for for free under the tab. So. You know, when they say there's a recruitment, again, I, I, I met with the Paramedic Association of New Brunswick and, and, and they assured me, we don't have a lack of paramedics. Okay. We have a lack of paramedics that aren't getting full-time permanent work. So the government's trying to flip it around and say, oh, we have a recru recruitment problem. We don't have a recruitment problem. We have paramedics that are sitting at home not being able to work their shifts or, or, or get that permanent full-time status. That's the issue. 
Okay, I want to jump on now because we've only got a few minutes left here in the show. So we'll try to you know, get through the whole Auditor General's report in three minutes. <laughs> um, but I just want to uh, mention that a couple of weeks ago, of course, the Auditor General uh, reported that she's deeply troubled by the province's fiscal decline over the last 10 years. Uh, and we've increased our net debt in that 10-year period by $7 billion. Mm -hmm. Are we in trouble? We're in big trouble. I, I, I do believe that. And I, I don't want to overstate this, but we, we can't keep doing this. Um, you know, when you look at the deficits over the last 11 years, you're talking liberal and conservative governments. And people say, well, you know, the Gallant government, you know, they're, they're blowing our, 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 our finances, you know, out the window. And I'm thinking, yes, they are, but when you compare the current government's deficits with the previous conservative government's deficits, you'll find the previous conservative government deficit was much higher mm -hmm. than this current government's deficit. So it's a red and blue issue, obviously, that has gotten us to this place. And it is a huge issue. The Auditor General is absolutely right. We have got to get our fiscal house in order. Um, that's why we have said that and again, I don't think the Auditor General is utilized to the full extent that she could be utilized. Mm -hmm. they, they, they keep her poor and broke so that she can only pinpoint certain uh, government programs and finances to investigate and report on. Mm -hmm. What she needs is more money. And I'm a firm believer every dollar you give to the Auditor General will return 10 to the taxpayer. Are you concerned that government might be intentionally trying to choke out the Auditor General to reduce the amount of power the Auditor General has to review the of province's course, spending? Of course, of course they are. Look, if, if, if the government actually gave the Auditor General all the money she needed, uh, you know, I joked about it, you know, there'd be more red and blue skeletons falling out of the <laughs> closet. They wouldn't have enough graveyards to bury them all. Uh, no, of course they want to keep her broke and, and, and quiet. Um, but, I, you know, I, I've got a lot of respect for, for Kim McPherson as well as her staff. Um, when the ATCON report came out, you know, she went to the government, she said, I need more money to, mm -hmm. to do a further investigation on ATCON. Of course, the government said no, because half them were involved in ATCON. <laughs> of course, they're not going to give her more money. But she did it anyway. She just said, well, that's well, fine, I'll do it anyway. That might be over budget, but, but we're going to do this. She needs more money, she needs more resources. Do you think the government should uh, specify a specific maintained level of funding for the Auditor General's office? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, per capita, New Brunswick's Auditor General is the lowest paid in the country and not lowest paid, but lowest resource in terms of how much money goes into her, her uh, office. So, you know, there's no question. I, I, I'm a firm believer if, if, if I were empowered to say, simply say, look, what do you want? What do you need? It's at your disposal. Because again, what she does and the recommendations that comes out of her thorough, thorough reports, thorough investigations, when government adheres to those recommendations, you have a better government that works for the people in an efficient and effective manner. Well, Chris, that's all the time we have for tonight. I, I want to thank you very much for coming in to do the show. Thank you to our callers. Thank you to the volunteers who make this show possible. And uh, thank you to the viewers who are watching at home. Uh, have a great night, and thank you for joining us for Voice of the Province. Yeah.